you are at the Yammer and Viva Engage Surviving or Thriving webinar. Um, so today's session is, is really to share the highlights of uh, Swoop's most recent Yammer Viva Engage benchmarking report. Um, there's some really, really interesting data that we have to present to you today. Um, and we're, we're going to be, uh, as, as Laurie presents, he'll talk through various examples and um, sort of micro case studies, I guess, where we have the benchmarking report itself is chock full of, of advice, um, data, obviously, and, and some fantastic detailed case studies uh, from around the world, from our award winners um, for this year's report. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna, gonna look at the key themes. And um, we'll also hear from one of our award winners towards the end of the session who will share some examples of what they're doing. But um, I think now it's three minutes past the hour I make it. So um, I might just get things officially underway with a look at the agenda. What are we gonna cover? I'll just quickly do some quick uh, introductions and, and wish you all welcome to today's session. Um, and then we'll do a quick audience poll, just to, a couple of questions or three questions, just to get a sense check on where you feel you're at with um, with Yammer slash Viva Engage. And um, then I'll hand over to Laurie, who will, who will take us through the key findings from the report. So that's the thing that I know you're all really here to, to hear, um, as well as the announcements of our Collaboration Champions Award winners. And then um, I'll be joined by one of those champions. Um, to share a bit of their story and hopefully inspire you. So speakers today, I will start with the champion who will be joining us towards the end. On the right hand side there is Sarah Parry, who's from BIP UK and BIP US, head of knowledge management there. Um, I'll give a proper introduction to Sarah later on. Um, we also have on the call, obviously, Dr. Lawrence Lockley, Laurie, um, who is co-author of the report. And uh, yeah, it's going to take us through all of the key findings. I myself, obviously, am here. I'm the uh, director of customer success in Europe, and um, also on the call we have Gemma Saint, who's the director for customer success North America. Um, Gemma, I think uh, today your role really is going to be monitoring, managing the chat, um, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you for yeah. taking care of that. We do want to encourage everybody throughout the session, if anything pops into your mind, any observations, any uh, any thoughts, any questions, please do use the chat functionality. Um, and just, yeah, fire questions and thoughts in there. I think part of this kind of event that Swoop puts on is bringing the community of like-minded people together to share thoughts and, and ideas and concepts. And so please do use the chat for that purpose. Gemma will be keeping an eye on that. And Gemma, do call out during the session if you see anything really juicy that you want um, Laurie or myself or Sarah to, to pay some attention to. Um, now what I want to do is actually jump into Slido. And can I ask you all to either use your smartphone or head to slido.com and enter this uh, number in here? And we should, if I then... Share screen, if I switch to this thing, we can take a look. Yeah, so here we're looking at, do you feel readership on your Yammer network has increased or decreased in the most recent 12 months? Interested to see the sort of general thoughts on this. You can see the joining instructions on the left hand side there. Please jump in and share your thoughts. Don't worry, we are not tracking um, who's <laughs> saying what. This is all anonymous. <laughs> so static readership is currently sort of the overarching thing. Ooh. Oh, it's, it's a close race. <laughs> Is, I'm old enough to remember the old, old, old arcade games where you used to have to like roll a ball and you would see a electronic bar moving along. This reminds me of that. It's quite exciting. So very interesting to see. Uh, clearly, people are not feeling that readership has decreased over the last 12 months. That's a very strong message here. And 
Um, it's kind of neck and neck between whether it's stayed the same or increased. Um, be interesting to to hear later what you're seeing in the in the report, Laurie. If there's anything on this readership yeah. front. Let's jump to the next question now. You should all now be able to vote on engagement. So a little bit more deeper interaction than readership, but let's think about engagement. Actually being active, actually commenting, liking, posting, uh, reacting. Do you feel that's increased, stayed the same or decreased? Similar story, slightly more, slightly higher percentage of people feeling like engagement may have decreased. So interesting there to think that those who said maybe the readership has stayed the same or increased, but engagement may have decreased. Um, that would be an interesting trend to pick up on. I'm going to jump to the final piece on this, which is. Just off the top of your head, again, we're not testing anyone here. Um, if I was to say to you, what are the most thriving, the most um, interactive, the most active communities in your network? Um, what are the names of those communities? Just throw in any that spring to mind when you think about your Yammer, Beaver Engage network. Full company, yeah. And you can provide multiple responses here as well if there's multiple communities that you feel are thriving within your network. Interesting, I like hallway conversations. Give it a few more seconds before I deviate from this one. I can see interesting titles coming through there. Interesting to see technical practice network, um, smart worker, knowledge exchange, hybrid work, digital hero. I'm kind of seeing a bit of a trend in, in those community names, perhaps. All dogs of Scottish water. That's my kind of community. <laughs> OK, thank you, everyone, for just sharing, just to get a, a little concept, a little idea and hopefully encourage you to get your get your sharing juices flowing. Um, so keep those flowing in the chat as we go through. I'll um, step back into the main presentation now. And I'll hand over to Laurie. Um, over to you for the details on the report and the key findings. OK, thanks, Pete. Um, well, uh, this is number eight for us, uh, uh, eighth Yammer benchmarking report. And I have, I have said to some, this is our eighth and final Yammer benchmarking report. Now, some people are a little bit shocked by that, but then you probably get a bit of a hint when you see what we label this report as the Yammer and Viva Engage uh benchmarking report and it might be uh, microsoft's worst kept, worst kept secret but they officially haven't sort of saying that they're going to rebrand yammer but you know we're sort of speculating pretty much that that's a, a strong a strong possibility but nevertheless this year uh 97 organizations maybe slightly less than we've had in some other years uh, and that's mainly because 
we wanted to only select companies that had at least six months worth of data operating in this most recent COVID period. So uh, as you're all, all aware, you know, we are moving into a new phase with the pandemic now, and most people have migrated or were out of the pandemic. We are working now flexibly, mostly in hybrid working places. So we wanted to get that sort of space where people were, were migrating, if you like, from being locked down to moving into a sort of new work style. So, um, so that's why you know, we, we were more selective this year with 97 organisations, still a good sample, uh, some 3,200 Yammer communities, and of course, lots and lots of people and lots and lots of interactions. So uh, as you'd expect, those that aren't familiar with Swoop, you know, for, for benchmarking, you actually have to, to connect to the Swoop uh, platform. So you either have to be a customer or trialing Swoop. And, and of course you can trial for free and a number of organisations look up that offer. Uh, but when you do connect to Swoop, we actually connect, we actually measure all interactions of all employees on Yammer, right? So it's not a sampling exercise, it's a complete sample. So that's what's quite unique about how, how we do our benchmarking. We actually see what everybody's doing and we aggregate that off, of course, up to the inter enterprise and to the community levels. So uh, let me go to the next slide. I'm hoping that this thing is going to work. Um, what are you seeing? You're still seeing this, that one slide, I'm assuming. Laurence, would you mind switching to presenter view? It's very small in the corner right now. OK, Pete, um, where do I do that? Because I'm looking at presenter mode now, aren't I? Have you got two screens, Lawrence? I've only got one screen open. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm aware of that trap. So yeah, I've if only you, got if my... you go, you should see something top left, and it should say you need to go into presenter mode, or just go kind of full screen on PowerPoint. Because at the uh, moment we're kind seeing... of like seeing two screens with the, with the. Um, that's better. You got it. Okay. 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 Great. That's good. good. To go. But. I'm not controlling now, I don't think. So let me just request control again, Pete, and see what happens here. OK. Please go to the next slide. Uh, let me try down the bottom. Let me just. Oh, no. Let's see yeah, something's not quite working here. Let me stop. Oh. That looks good now. Yeah, but I'm, I, I'm, I don't think I'm controlling the actual, uh, con I'm not controlling the actual screen. Worked when we trialed it, didn't it? <laughs> oh, I'm waiting for approval, Pete, so can you give me access? Because I'm, yeah, it's just so. Uh... Yeah, for some reason, it's not letting me control the actual um, slides. Maybe, Pete, if you can. Yeah. Um... No. Maybe if you take control, Pete, and just move the slides because it's sort of for some reason it's not it's not moving. Pick your phone over there. Pick your phone over there. Have you got control back there? Oh, here. Sorry, we're on. We're on this one. Let me talk to this slide, and then we'll go to the next. I'll let, I'll just ask you to go to the next slide. So, and if, there's there was five key findings in the report. So, um, uh, as we probably intimated, the actual participation. Right, and when we talk about participation rate, this is the gross number of people that are actually accessing Yammer, either as a reader or interacting, has gone up. In fact, it's double since 2020. So in essence, we are seeing a lot more people on Yammer. Uh, a lot of that, I must say, um, was a result of the integration with Outlook and with Teams uh, channels, which I think happened in 2021. So that generated a huge bump in readership. And of course, we, we, uh, we saw that. And um, 
And um, unfortunately, I, I guess, a lot of those newcomers actually stayed as passive participants. So they were mostly reading, or if they actually did do something on Yammer, they really, what we would call acting as observers. And in, in, in Swoop, we actually have a classification for a user that does less than one thing every two weeks. We call them an observer and we monitor this, the number of observers. So we think that's a pretty good measure of passive participation because they at least have gone into Yammer and pushed the like button once so they know how that works. But if they don't do much more, then we, we, we call them passive so um, as well. But nevertheless, the readership and the passive participation, you know, has actually gone up. And of course, the challenge is to convert some of those passive users into more active users. Now, <clears throat> having a large number of passive users actually does impact the overall performance according to our swoop measures, because the majority of our swoop measures are relationship centered. So, so we look for people interacting with each other, being active in conversations. And you know, if there's a big number of, of passive users, that impacts the proportion of uh, proportionate scores in of swoop measures. And really for this year, the first time we're seeing a majority of swoop measures actually going backwards. Now that really hasn't happened before. Uh, so, but well, I'll talk to that. There's some rationale behind that. So uh, we'll get to that in a later slide. Uh, could you get the next slide, Peter? You're moving. Okay, all right. So as I said, the, the, the challenge is to convert the, the passive users to active users. But I guess the nice thing is that there's no shortage of high performing communities and good stories. Now the report is filled with half the report for the last number of years has been case studies. And those case studies have been drawn from the leaders that we've identified through our benchmarking. And you know, they are impressive and they're they are, you know, they they're you know, they're just uh, energizing to read, I guess. I and I, I sit in on all the interviews as well and you know, you think, well, you know, Yammer is really doing some special stuff here, you know, but you know, unfortunately, there's a lot more people could get that value. And that's why we really share these case studies, because we want to inspire people, inspire them and saying, this is what can happen with you. So so I guess the good news is that those stories haven't reduced. There's plenty of those around and we keep sharing those and we keep trying to encourage people. This is what it could be like. Now, this year, in terms of the communities and the last few years, we've been benchmarking at the community level and identifying the high performing communities and also sharing their stories. And they don't have to come from high performing organizations. They can be modestly performing organizations. And we often say that, you know, even if your whole enterprise isn't performing all that well, if you don't look, if you look a little bit, you'll find some communities in your organization that are doing very, very well. And you should use those as inspiration. And that's what we try to tell our, our, our clients that, you know, don't despair if your overall score is bad because you will find some good examples inside. Uh, so this year we decided to embellish our community measure. A few years ago, we, we actually uh, uh, undertook quite a, a renovation of the way we assess communities and we come up with quite a, a sophisticated measure of performance. But we started reading the literature about, you know, this, this thing about thriving communities. And one particular article that Microsoft uh, wrote, which I'll refer to later in the talk, you know, talked about the fact that they had stopped measuring employee engagement because they felt that it wasn't working for them. And they started to sort of try and measure employee thriving or thriving groups and thriving employees. And, and we're energized by this because last in last year's report, we actually measured the happy, a happiness factor for communities. And we used our sentiment analysis uh, to, to do that. You know, So we thought, well, we, we're most of the way there with sentiment. So by adding growth and one other factor, we thought we could actually measure how thriving these communities are and benchmark them against that sort of, that measure. And that's what we did. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation as well. Now, our reports always have a futures area, and there's a number of things that we put in the future areas. You know, we speculate about what will happen with Viva and so forth. But one of the things that I found quite interesting is, is we wanted to think about uh, what does the, the new great leader look like in the post-COVID world? 
You know, so in the hybrid world, are the leaders that currently lead going to be the same as we see after the pandemic, which is where we are right now? We hypothesise that that's probably not true, and we think that we've got some evidence of that, even through through Microsoft's recent uh, uh, work trends report, where they talk about you know the productivity paranoia. I would more like likely call it a productivity paradox because. In fact, I think the numbers, I won't get them precisely right, but 85% of leaders weren't confident that their workers were being productive, yet something like 80% of workers felt they were being productive. To me, that's a paradox. And to me, that means that the leaders and, the, and their staff just aren't connected. Right? So I, I think that the new style of leader is something that we wanted to explore. And with that, we went outside of just Yammer. We looked at the outer loop connections, of course, facilitated through Yammer. The inner loop connections facilitated through Teams and Teams channels. And also how much an individual shared content via SharePoint. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. So the next slide, please. OK, so that, as I said, I'm going to concentrate on these three areas. So I'll talk a little bit about the participation and the engagement. Uh, uh, we have a very specific, I might say, we have a very specific way of measuring engagement because we consider engagement as people to people engagement, not necessarily how people engage with content or the platform or what have you. So maybe our results are a little bit different to what the survey and what people's general interpretation of the word engagement is. I'll talk, dig, drill into the thriving, inspiring communities, and I think that that's a very interesting area. And of course, do a little bit more on the new hybrid working leader. So next slide, thank you. So uh, in terms of the participation, right? So let me get let a couple of things clear. We do measure uh, participation in a number of ways. One is what proportion of the eligible people are actually reading or being active on Yammer, right? So. Now, when we talk about the eligible uh, users, that's basically the way we measure that is the number of user accounts. Now, often we find with, and I'm sure you'll see this in some of your own organisations, you've actually got more user accounts than you have employees. You might think that's strange, but in fact, you know, when we look, drill into it, you know, you have people that are given temporary accounts, you might have contingent workers that have accounts and what have you. Uh, you know, we find that number sometimes problematic because, you know, some organisations are much stricter about how they manage user accounts than others. Uh, so, but nevertheless, when you can see the, the size of the numbers of the average number of user accounts, uh, and I'm just putting the last uh, five years here, you know, they really have jumped up in the, in the last few years. So despite the fact that there might be some, some um, variability in how that number is measured, it's pretty clear to us that, that bigger organisations are using Yammer. And even if we use the, the measure of active users, where we have hard data about them actually having read something or pushed the button on Yammer, uh, you know, that number has, has grown as well. So we know that Yammer is being used by more people and by bigger organisations. So next slide, thanks, Pete. Um, this should be a build, Pete, so I don't know why that's the next one should be the first Whoop, it's going past three three slides that's a bit of a problem if, for me if it's not going to do that build Sorry about that, but you know, yeah, obviously it all worked perfectly in the rehearsal. Okay, here we go. So this is this uh, this graph shows the last six years of results. Now, in this case, the participation is the way we measure it internally within the Yammer product, and what it is is the percentage of people that are not observers. Right? Remember when I said. An observer is somebody who does something less than once every two weeks. Okay, so there's only one signal less than once every two weeks. We will look at the others. So the, the not observers are the participants. And as you can see, uh, prior to the COVID period, 
that number was going up, right? So, but then during the COVID period and beyond, it's been dropping. So that's the other reason why we're saying that the there is more passive participation in Yammer since the COVID period started in 2020. Now, engagement, which we measure as our best measure of that is reciprocity, and reciprocity is two-way interactions. So if you post something, someone replies to your post, and then you reply to one of their posts, we count that as a reciprocal interaction, and we count how many people you have that sort of relationship with, and we measure that as our engagement measure. So it's a pretty strong measure. And uh, you can see that other than 2019, you know, it was sort of slowly going up and kept going up to 2021. And then in 2022, this year, both of them dropped together, right? And that's one of the reasons we see that this, what we're saying that we, you know, we're starting to retreat. Uh, but we've got some some rationales for that. So let's go to the next slide, Pete, and hopefully it's a build. Whoop, uh, no, this oh yeah, we can go with this one then. Okay, so and our rationale is that because we're getting bigger organisations, more people actually inter joining them, whether they're joining as readers or doing very little as observers, we've got more people, right? And the fact is that when we've got more passive people compared to active people, the swoop measures actually start to retreat because we do look at the proportional uh, participation. Now, as I said, they were going up uh, pretty consistently until recently, and this year they've taken a dive back. Now, on this on this diagram, you can see behind that sort of helix sort of going backwards to go forwards is our maturity model. And those that aren't familiar with with our benchmarking and the way that we we measure progress, uh, we developed this um, maturity model. We didn't uh, invent it ourselves. We compiled it from a number of maturity models that were around for Yammer in in you know eight or nine years ago. Uh, and uh, we came up with what we thought was the most appropriate thing to measure progress. So it's a basically a six it's a six step three stage model that looks linear, but we know isn't traverse linear now, you know, in a linear way now. So it starts basically with a social media phase, which is what we're mostly experiencing now, which is just like Facebook, book, or Twitter or LinkedIn inside, right? So very much sharing information via social means. The next phase, the transition is to when we start to see people building relationships, connecting on Yammer. And we call that the social networking phase. So that's when they're connecting and more actively sharing content with each other. And the final phase we call the job fulfillment phase. And this is where we think the real big benefits come through Yammer. And this is where complex hard problems are solved through deeper discussions on Yammer, and also we start to see more disruptive style innovation, more curiosity, more reciprocity, more diverse audiences and so forth. So, so that's our sort of our end point in terms of maturity. But what you can see here is that what we're, what we're seeing is that we're going backwards, but hopefully to go forwards with a bigger cohort, right? So instead of what we found in the early days of Yammer, maybe even up to 217, 218, you know, the average number of staff in an organisation that might participate in Yammer might be somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, even including the passive participants. Now we're up in the 80, 85 percent. So an 80, 85 percent is getting close to what, you know, what email is, you know, so it's up there with, you know, as close as you're going to get for the whole organisation. So, so if in the next few years we can sort of move that up the maturity curve with 80 or 70 or 80 percent of the organization and that's really scaling so i think i think that's something that we've got to look forward to and hopefully we'll we will see in the next few years uh whether it's still called yammer but my guess is it'll be called viva engage but nevertheless it's 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 the same but an enhanced sort of product if you like so next slide thanks pete Okay, so now we're going to move on to this interesting topic we call thriving, inspiring communities. Now, this is an article that was published, you can see it was in June 24, not that long ago this year, by 
uh, Klinghoffer and McCune are people analytics members, uh, executive actually, within Microsoft. And they made the interesting claim in this HBR article that Microsoft no longer measures employee engagement. Now, that's, that was pretty stunning to me. And they said, well, you know, we've been running these surveys, you know, we've been getting these results, you know, we can't really make sense of the results too much. I don't think it's really telling us that much about that, but we really like this idea of thriving. And we also ran, ran some survey survey questions around employee thriving. And they also did a little bit of workplace analytics on, on that and found this is actually a much better measure of the health of, of Microsoft. So we're going to move to employee thriving. That may have caused a little bit of uh, concern with the Viva people who are just launching Viva Engage. But nevertheless, you know, we found this quite interesting. And we and as I said before, uh, you know, the fact that we were measuring, we had measured sentiment in, in communities just last year, we thought, well, we can measure that again. And I might say going back to 2021, what we found was that sentiment analysis can be a bit problematic. Right? So uh, sentiment generally measures positive and negative things. But what we found last year was that if your context was negative, in other words, if you've got a very energetic community around cyber security and therefore you're always talking about people trying to break in or what have you you'll get a very negative sentiment score so we prefer to use the term energy whether it's positive or negative because largely what we find is yammer isn't a place for a lot of toxic posting i know that some of you'll say yeah well we found one or two but on the whole we find that energy is a better measure which means it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative, it's energetic. So we actually took that finding from last year into this year to, to use sentiment to measure that, that part of energy within the community. We also measured growth because when we talk about thriving, you talk about a thriving gar garden or thriving babies or what have you, they're growing, aren't they? So we wanted to include that element. And we also included one other one was that, you know, if you've got a thriving community, there's a you know you would expect that they'd be posting something at least once every working day, so five days in seven. So we also put that 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 filter on as well. And this is this is our our measurement frame for thriving communities. It's pretty busy as you can see, but on the left you'll see is how we measured our measures that up to 20, up to this year, which included you know I can count those numbers. I think it was twelve swoop measures. You know, four factors, participation, engagement, responsiveness, innovation, right, that largely sort of um, map our maturity. Um, we added the energy and the growth, and we actually weighted it so that it was 50% of the score. So we were actually, in some ways, overweighting those areas because we wanted to really discover what we people would say were thriving communities, and we applied this measure to the 3,700, uh, 200 communities that we collected data on. And it actually reduced to about 450, I think. I don't know, I've got the number exactly right, but about 450 communities that, that uh, and of course the ones that were at the top of that ranking were the ones that we reached out to find out who they were, because you know, in Swoop, we don't have any names, we don't have people's names, community names, we just have IDs, we just have metadata. So, to find out what's going what's going on, we have to go back to the owners of those IDs and and ask whether they're happy to participate in our uh, case studies and so forth. And and happily, a lot of them are. I mean, most of them do participate in a discussion. Some of them are a little shy about being published, but but mostly, you know, uh, we've had a hundred percent record. In when we've said somebody is good, they have been good, right? So so we've been pretty happy about that, you know. But I might say with, with one interesting rider, right, this year, as I said, the, the overall measures sort of did retreat a little bit, right? Now, um, one company, the company that ended up at the top of, and this is digressing from the communities, that, that ended up at the top of our, uh, our enterprise, the top of the 97 organisations, was actually what we call a mid-sized organisation, which was the first time we found an organisation of reasonable size topping the list. They had said to us that they felt that their performance had actually got worse than last year. So, uh, and in fact, in the way it was measured, it had got worse, but everybody had got worse by those same measures. So they were pleased to see the benchmarking results and say, well, actually, they hadn't got, got worse. They'd actually got better. So 
but it was all relative. It's relative, and that's why we do benchmarking. But uh, now to get back to the thriving communities, let's let's move on to see what we saw. Laurie, okay, so sorry, Laurie, yeah. I'm just going to uh, interrupt while you're talking about thriving community communities. So Andrew Clark's actually asked, how do you report thriving communities to executives when they want to know sentiment? When they want to know just sentiment. The sentiment. Yes, that's okay. what Andrew's asked. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I mean, uh, sentiment analysis is, you know, you know, in, in my deep, dim past, I used to be an artificial intelligence researcher, long enough ago, and I used to even lead a very big research group, and so I, I have a sort of soft spot for AI, but I have a, a healthy respect for how good and bad it can be. Right now, when we introduced sentiment anal and analysis. Um, uh, probably five or six years ago into Swoop, and we're using cognitive services, right? We didn't build this ourselves. We used Microsoft's product. Uh, so it's their research that we we're sort of leveraging. Uh, we did quite a bit of research on, on um, uh, sort of how reliable it was. And, and largely, as I said, you know, people think that positive sentiment is good and negative sentiment is bad. And I must say that people... That, that use sentiment, uh, community managers are looking to use sentiment to identify quickly toxic <laughs> posts so that they can shut them down <laughs> really early. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, that's very, and that's very important that, that, that you were able to do that. But as I said, it, it's more of a risk factor in terms of using sentiment that way. Uh, largely what we find is that when the sentiment engine says negative, Often it's not negative at all. It's just that the topic that they're talking about is negative. So anything that's got negative words, like somebody tried to break in here, or that we've had this sort of, or a support call, somebody's had a problem here, you might have a very energetic sort of customer support or help desk or what have you. They're going to be rated very poorly because all they'll see is complaints, right? You know, so so that's why you've got to be a bit careful about just saying they want to see sentiment. They don't want to, you know, like. You know, it, it's it's got to be used carefully, right? And that's why uh, last year, as we said, you know, it was just as many useful and positive and contributing communities that would have been classified as poor sentiment groups, uh, yet were very very constructive, doing great jobs, lots of energy, and what have you. So, all I'd say to, to the executives is be careful when you ask for. AI-based sentiment and how you interpret that, you know, so because because negative doesn't always need negative, and sometimes positive doesn't necessarily is not necessarily good as well. I mean, you you know, there's plenty of positive sentiment in in uh, in in some communities that are really just congratulating each other about something that's not really that important, you know. So you've got to got to got to provide you've got to add some judgment to the way you use some of these technologies. So. Um, but nevertheless, let, let's if that hasn't answered, we can have that discussion offline as well because we've got we've got blog posts on 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 our sentiments. If you want to blog, uh, search that, you know, we've got some very interesting experiments we ran early on with um, with uh, those of you in the US. One of your former presidents was actually one of the um, subjects of our sentiment analysis uh, in one of our exercises. So, uh, and I think he's having another go apparently. So, okay, so. With the thriving, as I said, we had about 450 odd uh, uh, um, communities that we identified as leading thriving communities. So we compared those against all the ones that weren't sort of um, classified as thriving, uh, just to see what the difference was. And what we found was that, that uh, on average, they were four times larger, more members than the other communities. Now, maybe that sort of makes sort of sense because you know, we did say they had to have a post every working day, uh, but they also had a 40% higher levels of active participation. And by that mean, means that people are replying, they're, they're engaging in conversation, they're, they're active, they're not just reading, right? So, uh, and that's always a good measure. And also we found that the last point should be that um, when we applied our our 2021 measure without the thriving parts to it, so just the sort of what we would have called the performance measure for communities, they were 19, nearly 20% higher performing than the other communities as well. So what that says is, is that, that 
you can be thriving, but you're also doing all the other things that aren't necessarily associated with just the thriving sort of statement. So, so I think what that tells us is that the Microsoft sort of uh, people, Alanix Atlantic, people are probably right that, you know, thriving is good, you know, and if you have a thriving community, you're, you've got a, a high performing community as well. And I think largely that's true. Okay, so let's, who are those thriving communities? And, and what I'm going to go through here is, is just a classification of the number of ones. So I've picked out three themes of communities. We probably had, I don't know, 20 communities that we went out and reached out to find out what they were. Um, the first one I'm calling purpose-driven communities, but largely these are communities that are driven by societal issues like LGBTQIQ, we sort of sustainability, sort of vaccine, COVID vaccinations. This is just an example of a post that we, you'll see in the report. There's, there's a few of these uh, celebrating sort of um, pride days, they're calling this purple day. Uh, this generates a lot of engagement, if you like, and it's broad based engagement. So it's very inclusive as you, you, you would expect. And uh, of course, there are downsides to this that we found last year that bringing these societal issues into the enterprise does cause a few headaches for the internal communications people that are facilitating these communities. So saying, well, you know, like, what do we do if we see a, you know, a, a, an opinion that we're not particularly happy with? Well, you know, we had that discussion last year, but largely uh, these are positive things, you know, and um, what we might have said uh, maybe even as little time ago as three or four years ago, that these sorts of communities are non-work communities. I think the world has changed now, and I think we're starting to call it, these are definitely work-related communities, right? These speak specifically to your diversity and inclusion policies. They engage the whole organisation. And, you know, from what we, we're hearing and reading and seeing, you know, that, you know, uh, if organisational leaders don't take a position, even a position on these sorts of issues, you know, they're going to get marked down by their staff. So, uh, you know, rather than just just passively look at them or being a bit concerned about them, you know, staff are basically demanding that leaders actually engage on these topics online in their Yammer network. The next one we, we saw a number of examples were, which is probably a little bit more directly work related, is helping the front line. You know, so frontline workers often are the ones that are, uh, are, it's hard for them to be on Yammer, right? What we often find is that the people that are on Yammer of the people that facilitate their engagement. So when they can, when they can, uh, if they're interacting outside of Yammer with these these facilitators, they're actually acting on their behalf. Now, this this particular one uh, is from Home Depot. I don't know, Ty, if you're on the call, <coughs> but um, we had a very very good discussion with Ty on on this one, and it was about. Uh, uh, a community of just two ladies that were facilitating a measurement community for all of the stores in, in Home Depot, and that's a lot of stores. So they could ask them questions about anything to do with measurement in the shop. And of course, they wouldn't always know the answer, but what they sort of strove, strive to do was get the answer for them, right? So they were super brokers of answers to questions. So it was a huge Q&A forum facilitated by two women, full-time staff, that actually managed their time so they covered as much of the time zone as they could. And they were very reliant on Swoop. In fact, I think the, the, the quote that Ty mentioned was that they said, I think you live in different cities. They were saying, you know, if you don't give us access to Swoop, we're going to come down and beat up on you or something like that. So so we're, we're quite amused by that, but we're quite... Um, energized by what we were seeing. Um, uh, the third one was was um, stress relief, which is really what we would call non-work one. So, of course, one of them was the dad jokes. And of course, we saw the Dungeons and Dragons and, and so forth um, uh, community as well. Uh, this one was a particularly interesting one because it was a, a, an Australian bank's branch or community in the Philippines, and it was run by uh, a lady who was her formal job was a tech support woman, somebody who could help people working remotely to make sure that their technology was working for them. But her side hustle was she was a very interested in sustainability and growing your own food. 
So she 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 used the community to actually share hints on how you could grow your own food and even starting to give plants away to people. So and that became one of their most thriving communities, and in fact one of the most thriving communities that we analyzed. So I should move on, I think, because we're um we're running a little bit late on time. So the final one, uh, this is the leaders I talked about. Uh, what we did was I, I measured the reciprocated relationships that people had. There was that we had about 1,200 people in this this sample across four organisations. I think so. It wasn't wasn't the whole sample, but it was a reasonable size sample. Uh, but we wanted to understand uh, what these sorts of leaders look like. People that could have a strong inner circle and outer circle, or inner loop and outer loop, as Microsoft calls it, but also actively shared content on SharePoint. And we and you can see where I shaded. We looked at those people that were up there in the top right. And we went back to the organisation and said, well, you know, we gave them the ideas and said, well, tell us a little bit about these people. Now, intriguingly, you know, we found that one of them had just been voted employee of the year by their peers. Another two were actually company founders, right? So, uh, so these were clearly leading people. So it's really whet our appetite to look at this uh, hybrid working post-pandemic leader. So uh, if any of you are, are interested in that, reach out to us because we're going to do more in this area. You know, we think there's there's really something to being able to predict who's going to be a leader in this space. Now, the next slide, Pete, we did find one particular person who was a member of Real Foundations. They're a real estate and consulting organisation in the US who, who have quite a presence or a, a service area in India. They've been leaders in our benchmarking pretty much from day one on all of our products, right? So they're good. And, and David is actually a co-founder of Real Foundations. And interestingly, he, he wrote an article on how he works and he, he recorded a YouTube video. So, you know, we didn't have to do anything, basically. We didn't have to talk to him. We could just, so uh, you can see in the report, you'll see a, a, a summary of his article. You can go and read the article, watch the, watch the YouTube video. But, you know, in my mind, David is a sort of uh, hybrid working leader that, you know, we, we would all aspire to be. And of course, he's been doing this far longer than, than the pandemic. So, so because Real Foundation has been a leading organisation. So on this, so Pete, I think we'll just move on because we're running late, I guess. So, over to you. Yeah, time time is pressing, but I think, like I said, Laurie, people are mostly here to hear the highlights from you. So, just want to say thank you so much for for staying up until it's almost 2 a.m. I think for you now. Um, all of us in the Northern Hemisphere appreciate it. And yeah, thank you for those insights. A, a lot to mull over in there. And obviously um, this is just the highlights. There's a lot more in the report and more detail on the case study. So make sure you, you download the report as soon as you get a chance, if not done so already. Um, right now with time in mind, I just want to sort of quickly um, call out the, the UK, US, Europe, um, organizations listed on here. Um, the Home Depot, I think, is well worth a, a mention around the thriving communities piece. Um, a standout performer there with three communities ranked in the top 10 globally. Um, the number one most thriving community was at a US insurance company, Progressive, and um, really, really interesting to see there. Two US organizations really performing well in that thriving community um metric um bip uk and us were the top performer overall in the small organizations category and interestingly second in the world of all organizations benchmark so um that's why i kind of want to quickly whip through this so we can talk to sarah and learn from some of what they're doing to to really perform well beyond the size of their organization shout out as well to real foundations laurie mentioned previously and klm uh, KLM was the winner of the medium-sized organization for EMEA. Um, yeah, that's uh, th there's case studies from all of these organizations within the report. So um, with speed in mind, I do want to now jump into uh, ask Sarah if you want to come off mute. Um, I'm hoping you're, you're still on the call. Um, yes, I am. Hello. <laughs> fantastic. Welcome. Thanks, and, um, yeah, so so Sarah, um, many of you may recognise Sarah um, Chaucer, 
has now become BIP UK and BIP US. I, I guess that's that's sort of the, the quick way to put it, Sarah, right? The the brand transition is in effect. Um, okay. And so Ch Chaucer have been mentioned in many of our previous reports as leaders in the collaboration space. So for those of you who've been following Swoop for a while, you will recognize Sarah's name, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, now BIP UK and BIP US, Head of Knowledge Management. So just very swiftly, what does what does your role actually involve in in regards to um, enterprise social collaboration? Great, thank you, Pete, and, and thank you everybody um, on the call. So yes, uh, so knowledge management is all about connecting, and it's all about connecting and collaborating and finding the people who can help you um, achieve what you need to do. So um, for me, when when I became responsible for knowledge management, um, as it was Chaucer at the time, um, one of the things that I wanted was there's so much that you can document and there's so much that you can capture into methodologies and toolkits and things and you can put them in libraries and you can hope that people will go and use them. But at the same time, you also need to find that person that's been there, that's walked that walk before you and just being able to pick up the phone to them and have a conversation um, is crucial. So for me, that's why we started looking at Yammer um, to see could we have that place that was online where people could ask those questions and get in touch with experts really easily. And um, over time, it's it's just grown and it's very much part of our um, knowledge and comms. Uh, ecosystem. So we use Yammer and Teams and SharePoint all in combination, um, probably together with Outlook as well. We still send weekly emails and things like that as well. Um, but Yammer is really at the heart of that kind of engagement piece. So um, awesome. that's why I am a huge uh, Yammer fan. Cool. Um, so we're just going to quickly whip through um, some of the content from the case study that's in, in the benchmarking report. And um, I wanted to start with this piece because I think I love this because uh, you were inspired by the example shared at the 2021 Yammer Festival by Greco, right? And then you you said about right. kind of following that example. Do you want to just kind of explain what's going on on this slide? Um, yes. So I just want to say thank you to I think it was Paul <laughs> from yeah. Greco uh, who shared their experience. And I looked at that dashboard and thought, OK, um, I want to do something similar. I want to make sure, you know, we've got Swoop, we've got the analytics, we've got the data, we've got a lot of people in our organization who are passionate about data. I mean, it's, you know, it's the lifeblood of what we do. So here was some data around collaboration, around engagement. So I thought, why not just have it, you know, rather than just have it in Swoop, let's get that data um, in front of people and just being able to see uh, month on month how we're doing. So this is the dashboard. I produce it once a month. I then share it in a news post uh, in Yammer um, itself. And then I also write an article about it and maybe um, pick a theme. So usually depending on what the stats say, um, it'll inspire something and I'll write about it. And so I've written articles to help observers become responders. And I've talked about the nudges and I've talked about all the various different things. Um, and one of the things we do is, you know, we highlight our top topics and we celebrate mm -hmm. those top topics. We celebrate the groups where there's been a lot of activity in the past month. So it might have been tied into other things that are going on, um, you know, outside of, of Yammer. So initiatives that are running around um, so social responsibility and we've got lots of employee resource groups who are all represented inside Yammer. We've got lots of practices and industry groups that are represented inside Yammer. And it's all about seeing, you know, what's going on there and who are the people who are really helping to make it work. So when I post this, it's always a thank you post and it's yeah. always, a, you know, thank you for being here. And, and it's an encouragement to, you know, if it just just start that engagement. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you can see, um, as as Pete mentioned, you know, we are in the process of of um, becoming a BIP. And so some of the groups there, yes, they're still Chaucer. So rather than go in and say everybody's, you know, needs to change, I'm doing it with 
the owners and really engaging those community admins in making that you know evolution and saying well what do you want your name to be and you know mm. how do you want to represent yourself and with the new um branding that we've got going on so just that's, it's it's really cool to hear that sort of ethos of um shared ownership or empowering people right and it's it, yammer's just such a unique tool in the in the workplace comms landscape to be able to do that one thing i just want to point out on this report in particular is that stat 99 percent of messages sent on yammer were public so yeah. it's, uh, that impresses me um if you want to <laughs> so you've you've got a really clear definition of yammer as a public forum is that correct yes yeah absolutely so i say when people join the company and I do, you know, in onboarding sessions with them, I talk about, you know, team is teams is for your team. You know who's in your team. You go there, you do your work, you you get stuff done. Um, but then if you want to tell people about it, if you want to engage people in it, then you go and talk about it across the net the entire network on on Yammer. So we have lots of different communities and people can go and talk in those communities about the things that they're working on to that wider audience. So we make that very, you know, when when I was originally introduced to that concept of inner loop and outer loop, I, I totally took it on board and kind of went, okay, this is how we're going to make it work. Um, because you know our teams are necessarily um you know, kind of re restricted in that sense to to the people who need to be in them. Whereas Yammer, we can have a very open conversation and you don't need to know who has the answer because you can put it in Yammer and we keep it very, very open. And I yeah. think that then that goes on to show how, you know, there aren't that many private messages going on. That's, no, that's good. That So that clarity of purpose is obviously a key part of what's driving this award-winning performance. But I did want to touch on a couple of other things that are, spoken about in the case study. Um, I wonder if you can just sort of elaborate on one or two of these, this leaders getting on board, the hashtag new joiners was mm -hmm. an interesting one for me. And then this yeah. keep calm and craft community and the United <laughs> community were just some that I pulled out. So is there one or two things in there that you, you might share with the people on the call today? Um, yes, um, one of the things that we do is we encourage when people join the company, we uh, encourage them to do a, a new joiner post to introduce themselves to the rest of, of the company. And we ask them to do that in all company and they get a, a wonderful response, which is really nice and encouraging. And then that encourages them to do more things. And so we then have a number of different um, and, and I really liked uh, what Lauren said about um, the non-working non-work communities actually being crucial to work um, and I think that is true of so our, our united uh, community is one of the ones um, that is around uh, diversity equity and inclusion um, and it is united um, in the sense of uh, all different cultures and so throughout the year we've been celebrating um, different cultural holidays and things that have been coming up and so we get a lot of engagement with that and also we just learning you know about other people um and mm. and you know so it, it really um helps with that Sorry. Uh, that's, that's fantastic i know you're feeling the time pressure <laughs> so um <laughs> but look um for, for those of you sort of inspired by just these couple of quick examples i think the key thing is yeah read the report there's more details in there and um obviously if you want to connect with sarah um, then please seek her out on LinkedIn, I assume would be a good place, Sarah, and, and yeah, forge absolutely. those connections because yeah. we do we do love to to see friends of Swoop, customers of Swoop, all connecting with each other because it's it's really important to have this community learning and sharing with each other. And and a great example of Paul Brereton at Agreco sharing a, an example. You've taken that idea and run with it, and it's worked out really well for you. So thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. Um, with time in mind, we're we're at one minute past the hour here. So I do just want to wrap up with uh, with info, important info, obviously, how you can register to download the report. You can either go to swoopanalytics.com and find the report under the Yammer benchmarking section of our website. You could use this QR code now to, to quickly access that, register and download the report. Um, Another interesting thing is obviously we have the Yammer Festival coming up on the 7th of December. 
So another one to Google, the, the Swoop Yammer Festival. Um, on the following slide, I've got a, a QR code where you can jump to register for that event. But an important thing we do at the Yammer Festival is we actually um, announce the winners of the Yammer Community Champion Award. So we're seeking nominations. Um, we want lots and lots of nominations of people from within your own Yammer, Viva Engage network, who are really passionate and really leading the way in terms of building community within your organization. So they don't need to be a formal community manager as their job title, but someone who is leading a community or inspiring a community, it would be really great to just nominate that colleague of yours for, for a, a, an award that is on a global scale. Um, and we'll announce the winners of that at the Yama Community Festival on the 7th of December. Um, the, the link to register for the Yama Community Festival is right here. Um, so if you if you don't have anything else already booked in that's absolutely vital on Wednesday, December the 7th, make sure you make time to join this uh, festival. It's a half day event, all online, and we've got fantastic speakers from some amazing organizations who are doing awesome things. So um, I can't kind of be, I can't, I can't produce enough hyper, hy hy hyperbole to um, speak speak up of the Yammer Festival. It's just a really fantastic event um, where the global community again comes together to share great stories, great examples that everybody can steal and deploy within your own organization. Um, on that note, that just leaves me to say thank you to everyone who's attended today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Hope that you've you've enjoyed it. And an extra special thanks again to you, Laurie, for staying up so late or so early <laughs> and, uh, enjoy, enjoy <laughs> tucking up into bed at 2am uh, just after 2am okay. so thank you for joining all the way from australia and okay. thank you to those of you around the world who've who've joined today's session really appreciate it thank you